If you're visiting with us, welcome to Calvary Chapel. We're glad you're here. And, and I'm so glad to be back at church as Cheryl uh, Truett and I have been gone uh, for the last week or so on one of those like dream vacations. We, we made a trip to Barcelona. And it was a blessing. You can't do that kind of thing all the time. <laughs> but but, but it, it's good to be home. And, and please know that if you ask me about the trip, you won't have to worry about me pulling out my phone and showing you 200 photos. Now, <laughs> now I can't guarantee you that I won't show one or two, but uh, Christina, I'll show you all 200. Christina gets this. <laughs> you know, last week, Josh introduced uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And and for, for those that are new, visiting with us, we began a verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 Corinthians uh, just a few months ago, and, and we find ourselves today in a chapter that some have, have been emboldened to possess this opinion that it's one of the most important chapters in Paul's writings. I think all of them are important, but it's definitely wonderful to read in chapter 15 how Paul emphasizes the integral role of the resurrection in the gospel of Jesus. Josh's message last week was called The Gospel Reality. And I'm reminded right now of just this reality of the resurrection as a core concept within the gospel and what it means. It's integral. It's a part of it. It is the gospel. It is the gospel reality. And for those here that are listening, that are, that are feeling shame and, and feeling regrets uh, because of some hurtful or sinful thing that you've done, you have something to solve your problem. It's the gospel. Like for those right now that are struggling with physical illness, facing death, mortality, you have a problem solver. The problem solver is the gospel. And for those now in this world where they are, they're warring. You know, Cheryl and I were in Barcelona, but as you know, on the other side of the Mediterranean is a brand new awful war. For those warring, whether in Ukraine, Russia, the Middle East, for those warring, there is an answer. The answer is the gospel. And for the follower of Jesus, our living hope is that because Christ is risen we can endure and, and, and actually be hopeful and joyful knowing in that enduring that the work of Christ also includes our resurrection. He was resurrected, but that work also includes our resurrection. Amen. Isn't that a glorious thing? So before we pick up our study at verse 12, Let's just take a quick look back and reminder on what Paul described as the good news. So you're going to hear teachers and preachers and, and people talk about the good news. And what that means is the gospel of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the good news is. The good news is the gospel in the Bible. And in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 15, where we are today, Paul said this, For I delivered to you... First of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Here is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the core gospel of the kingdom of God is that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. But at the church in Corinth, not all were understanding the resurrection part of the gospel. In fact, it appears as though some had even been questioning it when it came to the believer's resurrection, our resurrection, the resurrection of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And some were just kind of wondering how it all worked. You ever just wonder that? <laughs> they were just kind of wondering. So here's the gospel message. Paul writes about this in verse 12. He says, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. 
if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in, sleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. You hear that loud and clear? The last enemy that will be destroyed is dying. It's death. For he has put all things under his feet. And when he says all things are put under him... It is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, who is accepted, right, Jesus, then the Son himself will then also be subject to God, him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Our message today is called Because Christ is Risen. Because Christ is Risen. And I'm going to just ask the Lord to open our eyes to this reality of the gospel that is the great eternal hope of men and women who know their glorious future because of Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you this morning asking that you would do just that, that you would open our eyes to see beyond this room, to see beyond this life, to see beyond this flesh, to see beyond our problems, to see beyond our our ills and our sicknesses, to see beyond the addictions and to see beyond the troubles in our families, to see you and to see this resurrection for what it is, as much as we can take in of it to understand it as best that we can understand it with the help of your Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit in this room, Lord, and camp your angels around this campus to keep the enemy away today. And Lord, as we go through these verses, Lord, we listen loud and clear to what you're saying to us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear clearly what you would have to say to each one of us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So before we begin to spittle, uh, spend some time here together, I think I said the word spittle there, and none of you laughed. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for your graciousness. Before we begin to, begin to spend a little more time, I could caught up again, with these few words from Paul in the letter to Corinth, I'd like to begin with a sober reminder. It's funny, sober. Here I am saying spittle and things like that. You know, just to be clear, you know, sober is a little bit of a, an old-fashioned term, right? You know, in that... You know, some younger people may not use like sober as a word, you know, and, and I hope everyone here is sober today. <laughs> if you're not sober, you're in the right place to get right. <laughs> but what it means when you say to begin with a sober reminder is to remember something very serious about this resurrection that we're about to get into that we get to participate in. In that to have this thing, to enjoy this blessing, to enjoy this part of the gospel, we must remember that it comes with a sacrifice. Like to begin with the sacrifice of the Son of God. That in order to enjoy this part of the gospel, there was a price that had to be paid, right? And that's the sobering reminder. Believers here either sit or they stand together with this living hope solely because of the love and grace of a God whose heart and whose will was to redeem and sanctify his creation through the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. That's where we begin, right? 
The Lord's disciple wrote this, Peter, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That's pretty good. That incorruptible inheritance is reserved in heaven for all of us. And this inheritance reserved in heaven is for those who will place their faith in Jesus who paid the ultimate price with his life for sin he did not commit. It was my sin, all right? It was our sin that had to be paid for, which is mostly what it means to redeem something. You're paying for something. Jesus' death on the cross was the payment, and because of it, our faith in him makes us righteous before God. Now listen very, very closely to this. We use this term living hope a lot, and sometimes we can get confused. We sing a song about Jesus being our living hope, but when you look at the word of God and what that living hope means, it actually means something more similar to this, what I'm about to say that we can have a present and a very long future with God. And that's what Peter's saying here, that this living hope is the fact that, that we have this link between our present and our future, even as we're walking right now on the earth, that we walk with a hope, right? And that we're cognizant of the fact that we kind of have a foot on the earth and a foot in heaven at all times, right? Understanding there's a future, And that's kind of what Peter meant when he said that believers have a living hope. And it's just a thought we're going to briefly consider now. But it is the first of three fundamental blessings of the resurrection. And the first is this. I'm just going to put it out there. Is that because Christ is risen, we have a living hope. Peter wrote, blessed again, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Pastor F.B. Meyer called the living hope the link between our present and our future. This is the expectation of being taken home to heaven to be with Christ, to be like him and be in God's family forever is something we walk in with even right now. Peter said there's an inheritance incorruptible It doesn't fade away. It's reserved right now for you in heaven. The question is, are we living like it, right? And and are we living as though we have a living hope? So the things that right now you're working through in your life, right? When you're, you're looking at your marriages, you're looking at the problems you're struggling with work or depression or, or, or right now, maybe you're going through a very, very serious illness and that pain is just on you all the time. And, and, and it's unrelenting, right? Or it's a depression. You just can't get out of, out of that dark space, right? That fear, whatever it is that's always with you. The question is, are we thinking about this link that we have to the eternal at all times? And if we were, how would that change us now? We have a living hope. It's why it's our reflection number one. And Paul even speaks to the life of a believer and what it would be like if they didn't have this living hope, saying in verse 12, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is just empty. And your faith is also empty. I mean, so to be clear here, some of the Corinthians were trying to understand what Paul had told them when he said that Christians would be raised from the dead with incorruptible bodies. This is going to come to light later in this chapter. And for those curious, we will take a deeper dive into these things next week, like the glorified bodies, eschatology. And eschatology eschatology is just a fancy way of saying like the theology of what will happen at the end of time. That's what eschatology is. We're going to look a little bit at that next week. But in verses 13 and 14, Paul is making two very clear, important truth claims about the gospel. And these are important. 
The first is that the resurrection of the dead is intrinsic of Jesus' resurrection. We must know this. This is verse 13. Verse 13 makes this clear. And if you're not used to using the word intrinsic, intrinsic is a term that means it belongs to something by its very nature. The definition of intrinsic, it belongs to something by its very nature. And so the resurrection of the dead being intrinsic of Jesus' resurrection is a wonderful thing about the gospel. Like when you think about Nicodemus. When Nicodemus approached Jesus, you know, he's a teacher of Israel, right? He shows up one night, it's late in the evening, and when he gets there, he literally wants to know what it means to be born again, you know? And as Jesus is talking to him, he says, well, you've got to be born of the Spirit and water. Nicodemus is kind of scratching his head. He's like, I really don't know what that means, you know? And, and so the problem is, you know, he's, he's, he's quizzing the professor. The professor doesn't know. And Jesus says, you of all people, I mean, a teacher of Israel, you don't know what I'm saying? You must be washed of water and of the Spirit, right? And so Jesus, probably alluding to a couple of the prophets that spoke to that very thing, then tells Nicodemus, he says this, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You can see that within the gospel message. Right away, Jesus is putting out eternal life, everlasting life. Our resurrection is intrinsic of that gospel message. And verse 14 makes it very clear. The second true claim we can see here, though, too, is that Jesus' resurrection, again, I just said it, is intrinsic of the gospel. If it did not happen, the finished work of Jesus on the cross was not fulfilled. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he would have either been mistaken, an imposter, someone you couldn't trust, right? Because Jesus had promised that he would be raised from the dead. You might remember a couple of uh, occasions when he made these promises, there was a time when he came to the temple during Passover in Jerusalem, only to find it filled with a bunch of commercial activities going on. You may know the story. Jesus let everyone know in a very expressive way that he wasn't happy. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what he did, our Lord made cords and, and chased all the animals out with cords. Imagine that, right? And then all the money changers out there, he's throwing their money out on the ground. I mean, literally, a very expressive way. He's in the temple. He's visiting it. He's not happy, right? And so the people, they respond to his actions, and literally they're, they're saying things kind of like this. What kind of sign? I mean, can you show us? Since you do these uh, almost preposterous things with an appearance of being an authority for God. And Jesus said... Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. I mean, there was another time, too, recorded in the book of Matthew when the religious leaders were asking for a sign to prove his seeming authority for God. Probably what they really wanted to know was he actually the Messiah that the Old Testament prophesied of. So they request a sign. The thing is, is that the sign they were going to see was not the sign that God would provide. The signs they were looking for, the miracles, the healings, whatever those things were, the miraculous, the sign that God himself would provide would be the proof and only a sign God would provide. So Jesus answers them and he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The point in all this is that the proof or the sign that others were looking for would only be God's to show this generation. 
I mean, to be very clear here, God raised Jesus from the dead, testifying to humanity, to the angels, to all created things, that our Father in heaven was completely satisfied with the redemptive work of Jesus. This was the sign to them, and it's the sign to us now. And a most important question I would be negligent not to ask is, do you believe this fish story? I mean, we're not talking about just a really big fish, you know, that we pulled in over here in the lake, right? You know, we're talking about a fish that swallowed a man being likened to Jesus' body being held in the heart of the earth. The good news, in case anybody's wondering, is it's true. Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen, right? I heard a couple out there. I heard a lot more that second time. And a burden of proof that Jesus completed his work was only God's to provide and manifest when God raised him from the dead as a sign. And believe me, like if, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, hundreds of people in his day would have given anything to find a body and display it as dead to the world. Instead, the Roman guard, the Jewish community, everyone else trying to produce a corpse, right, to say this was absolutely not true, they just couldn't do it because it was an impossibility. Jesus was resurrected. And he was resurrected in body form. And so shall we be. So a second blessing we walk in as believers, and it's one that we praise God for now, is the fact that because Jesus is risen from the dead, so shall the dead in Christ rise. I'm going to borrow something the Anglican minister John Stott once said to make it clear about the place of the resurrection in the gospel. He wrote this, Christianity in its very essence is a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. I mean, this is Paul's sentiment. It's spelled out in verses 14 through 19. He writes, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is just empty. Your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men the most pitiable. That's if he hadn't risen from the dead, right? I mean, Charles Spurgeon said something that I think really emphasizes Paul's, Paul's words here. He said these words, If Jesus rose, then this gospel is what it professes to be. If he rose not from the dead, then it is all deceit and delusion. Well, here's the good news uh, for everyone. All this false hypotheticalizing is false. <laughs> right? It's not true. <laughs> Jesus is risen from the dead. And Paul says it in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So I'm going to take just a minute as we're, we're almost through <laughs> the message. I want to level set on just these last few, few, few words, right? As we're looking at these scriptures... Calvary Chapel, as a church, is known as, I would say, generally pretty theologically savvy. I'll give you an example. Someone came up to me after service three weeks ago and said, I want you to know I was just doing word searches on the things that you were teaching on Sunday morning, right? And so people are checking commentaries. That's kind of how this crowd can be. Like, so, so if you're new to the church, I want you, don't be intimidated by that, okay? That's, that's not everybody. But I mean, this is a church, if you can tell, this church loves the Word of God. 
Like we love it. We want it to be accurate. We want it to be true, right? And as we were singing, I speak Jesus, I think what we're trying to do when we preach and teach is just speak Jesus, right? I mean, we're trying to hit that center lane on all this. Now, I say all this to say that as we look at this particular chapter, we could probably spend two months on it, okay? I don't know that myself, the other pastors, feel led to do that just on chapter 15, that this is loaded with so many different themes and ideas, high theology. Paul, if you didn't pick up on it, was a pretty brilliant man. And he is so capable of writing about these things, drawing on the Old Testament, hearing as a steward of the oracles of God from Jesus direct. <laughs> He's receiving all this information. He's even creating new words in his letters that don't exist in the Greek to make it work with God, right? So as we look at a chapter like 15, there's a point at which we have to say, we have to say, God, what is it that you want us to be focused on in the 35 to 40 minutes that we have in your word today? What are those few things? Like I'll often pick three things or something like that. What are those things, right? But what Paul is doing in, in, in chapter 15 is, is probably a lot like what he said he would do when he spoke to the Romans. He said, then this is consistent with Paul being Paul. He said, how will they hear, right? How shall they not call on him? And who they've not believed? And how shall they not believe in him on who they've not heard? And how shall they not, or how shall they hear if there is no preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring the gospel, the good tidings of all things to people, right? So you have Paul basically in chapter 15 just putting it all out there, right? Paul being Paul, saying here's the whole, I don't know what you'd call it, doctrinal, <laughs> uh, whatever you'd call it, dissertation on the resurrection. But we as a church family have to have our own private Bible studies to pick up on some things and study some things. And we as a church family, when we gather, have to find out what's the mind of the Lord and what is he saying to us in this particular section today in the brief time that we have together. And so I say all that to say, you know, in a sense, an apology that we can't cover everything. But Paul is bringing the Corinthians this good news, this glad tidings of the resurrection in a way that both Jews and non-Jews alike would get. Again, the verses are loaded with several precepts about the gospel reality, the resurrection. Again, we could spend hours and hours on it. But we're going to move very quickly now through these verses in order to finish where the Lord, I believe, will encourage us to land this morning. And this is it. When you think of the gospel, when you think of the resurrection, God's righting the wrongs that have brought destruction, death, and brokenness to his family. God is righting the wrongs that have brought destruction, death, and brokenness to his family through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, briefly, if we look at verse 20, Paul wrote, Now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And we know when he uses the word, you know, or the phrase fallen asleep, everyone probably gets the fact that it represents death. But that death and that sleep is temporary because believers and even non believers alike will experience eternal life. One existence will be with God and the other absent of God unto eternal damnation. We're going to talk about that more next week. But when it comes to Jesus being called the first fruits of the believers who will rise again after falling asleep, Peter, or Paul, sorry, is absolutely alluding to the feast of first fruits that the Jews celebrated. For those of you that do know these things well, know your Old Testament, you've studied these things, you probably know that Jesus was actually raised from the dead on the first day of the Feast of First Fruits. It follows the Passover, Sabbath essentially. And in Jerusalem, that's when the feast started, right? So Jesus literally was raised from the dead on the first day of the Feast of First Fruits. Paul would know that. And William MacDonald, he puts it well too when you think about the feast and what it meant when it was a, a part of worship within the Jewish community 
He said this and put it well. First fruits were the handful of ripened grain that were pledged to God from the harvest field before the harvest started. They were a pledge, a guarantee, a foretaste of what was to follow. So when Paul is saying this first fruits concept with all of us as believers, you can kind of understand. Jesus, that's initial grain, right? And then what's to follow is the harvest. So when we remember what the Lord said once to his disciples, it's all going to come together. John chapter 12, Jesus said this to them. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified, meaning he's going to lay down his life. That's him being glorified. Isn't that a beautiful thing about God's grace? He considers that being glorified, sacrificing his life. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. You can hear Paul speaking in that, can't you? We just read what Paul said about this. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In other words, are we willing to lay down our life are we willing to die like that grain to be buried in order to produce fruit? So we have Paul's thoughts here aligned with Jesus. And as a side note, you may do this too. When I'm struggling to understand something in the Bible, oftentimes I just go right back to Jesus Christ and what he said. What did Jesus say about these things? How did Jesus live? How did he work through these things or these issues when that information is available? It's been said and noted by many in different ways that it's really not until a kernel of corn is buried and broken in the earth that its inner heart sprouts and then produces hundreds of seeds or kernels. Jesus is the first fruits of the grain to come, which is the resurrection of the saints. And in verse 21 and 22, moving quickly in the beginning, we're going to Go back to Adam in the beginning when Paul says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Adam and Eve walked, they talked, they communed in the closest of relationships with God in the Garden of Eden. And their bodies were were even highly immune to death, having access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Just check out Genesis chapter 3. But as most know here, a sin caused them to be expelled from the garden, which meant they no longer had access to the tree of life. And an even more grave effect on their health is probably the loss of fellowship with the holy God. So as by Adam... Death came to us all. Sickness, the wages of sin. Paul has said the wages of sin is death, and it's appointed to man once to die, right? And it's because of sin. But to be clear, earlier I mentioned God's family. The ministry of reconciliation Paul is talking about is that family being reconciled, right? And I'm just going to throw this out there to you all, right? John said, behold what manner of love the Father has shown to us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. We are in his family, right? And so you look at the original family, Adam and Eve. You look at the family that Christ has put back together. And you can see, you can see the correlations, right? Come in full circle, right? So in the beginning, you have Adam and Eve, access to the Father, walking with him in the garden, walking in the garden with God. And now, now with this spiritual family we're talking about, there's a restoration that's occurring through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Son of God, the only one that could bring the family together And physical death and spiritual death are the most obvious enemies of a forever family. So, something that could be easy to miss in all of this is is the resurrection's role in this sweet fellowship, this fellowship factor, this sweet fellowship factor. Just to keep that in mind as we continue to move through this, God has always desired togetherness. Togetherness. 
with this creation. He's always wanted to be a father to you and to me. So much so, right, that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life in his presence. So this invitation, this gift from our Father in heaven is really a a final blessing to thank him for today as we're looking at these scriptures. Because Christ is risen, believers are the Father's sons and daughters in his eternal family. And we open this message with words from Peter. Peter the second letter where he said, we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Who's the parent giving this inheritance? It's our father in heaven. That inheritance is real. And I'm going to attempt to make a point here that is very nuanced. Before I make it, do we need to stand up and stretch or is everybody good? I mean, this, this is going to take some thinking. <laughs> when the Lord, I'm going to borrow some thoughts from Dr. Carl Truman to make this point. When the Lord created us, when he made people, we were a who, okay? Not a what. We're a who. As much as you love your dogs, Dogs have a lot of similarities. <laughs> and if we ever lost our dear Sophie, she's a rat terrier, it would be very tempting for me to go get another rat terrier because of what that rat terrier is like, okay? I just love that dog. It's the first dog I, I ever loved like other people like their dogs. <laughs> I always wondered till I had Sophie. But if you go see a dolphin, you see 50 dolphins together, <laughs> They all look like a dolphin. (laughs) They're probably closer to, they're a created thing. Yes, they have life. But closer to a what, right? Here's where I'm going with this, okay? Is that we're all a who, but God is not just God. Knowing that God is God, knowing that God is your father is different than knowing who he is. Knowing who God is. Not just what God is. There's a big difference. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, the, the, uh, the, the evil angels and those associated thereof, they know what God is. Some even know who he is, but still fight him, right? But do we know as a son and daughter what it truly means to be a son and daughter? Like, it's not just pretty words on a paper. It's not something positionally up here to just operate to. It's something practically in our lives. Do we know who God is? God is a father. That's who he is. Father, along with the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as we look at these these final verses, think about it as a dad would think about resurrection. Think about why he would want his children resurrected. In verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. You heard that when Jesus delivers the kingdom to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, when the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That's really good. We know the end of the story. But think about verse 26. Like a father or a dad would think when Paul said, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. We thank God for us that that thing is destroyed. It's beautiful that the Lord has defeated death for us. But do we spend enough time thinking about how sin and sickness and death has caused our Father in heaven to feel? There are moms, there are dads here that have families completely strewn apart due to sinfulness, conflict, and other hurtful things. (laughs) 
there are parents here that have lost a child. And if you were to say to a mom and dad, if you were to say to a mom and dad, what could be the worst thing that could ever happen? It would be the loss of a child. What does sin do? What does sickness do? What does death do? You know, I have had, because of the blessing and honor to be with people when they die or around the time they die, I've had that being a pastor in a church over and over again. And there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I'm telling you, when you're dying and you're his child, again, if you've all ever had a child that's gone through sickness, is going through sickness, has got a mortal thing that's on your child right now, what would you do as a father? What would you handle as a father? You're going to figure out how to put down that enemy and that last enemy being death. And when I think about some of the things I've seen, when you are, has anyone ever been with someone in incredible pain, dying? Literally, the pain is unrelenting. It's a cancer that's absolutely painful. If you've ever been with people like that, I remember one time being with a friend of mine, and I'm telling you, she was, she was wailing, and she was crying, and she, you couldn't even understand her in her last couple of days. She was in so much pain, right? And I'm telling you, I sensed the Lord there with her. It's like when I look back at it, he was there. This is what pains him. Sickness and death is not what he ever wanted for his children, right? And so as you're thinking about these things, and you're thinking about the resurrection... By sending his only son, by sending a part of himself, he's able to restore a family. I mean, Dr. Adrian Rogers used to call his church, like, he used to always call his broadcasts and stuff like it, the forever family. To me, that's exactly what it is, right? That last thing that we looked at, that last point, that because Christ is riven, risen, believers are the father's sons and daughters in his eternal family. The question I have for all of us is, are we going to act like sons and daughters or not? Right? Do we know who he is? That he's a father in heaven that wants to be a father to us. Are we living like that? You know, because I like to always go back to Jesus to just really affirm that the, what we're talking about seems aligned with who he is. Remember this about the Lord. Jesus said to a disciple of his, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? If you want to know who the Father is, you just look to Jesus. Right? He also said to someone else, actually he didn't say this, someone else said this about him. The writer of the book of Hebrews said that Jesus is the expressed image of God's person. If you want to know the heart of the Father, take a look at Jesus Christ, right? So there is a final scene, we'll close with, when Jesus has these, these friends of his, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. And I'm going to tell you, when I read the scriptures about these friends, they just seem like a really sweet friend group, like, like a friend group is. He's in Jerusalem. He goes out with them that night, you know, that evening. Hangs out at their house, okay? He gets word that Lazarus is, is, is dying. Like he has a sickness unto death. And so he gets word of it. Martha first approaches him when he finally arrives after Lazarus has, has passed away. And she said, listen, if you'd been here sooner, he would still be alive. You could have saved Lazarus. Jesus' response to her was, he'll rise, he'll rise again. And then he said these words to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Well, John chapter 11, verse 32, Mary she came where Jesus was, and she saw him, and she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and he said to her, where have you laid him? 
And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead, but that's not the greater point with a finish. Biblical scholars hardly agree on the reasons why Jesus is weeping. They couldn't agree because you don't know. It's not written down. But I suspect that this enemy called death made Jesus, who was a friend, a savior, and a father, cry. His cross, his burial, and his resurrection would defeat sin and the enemy for the sake of God's eternal family. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come before you grateful. Grateful for this love that you have for us. You made us. You want to be in relationship with us. And you want us to be with you forever. Lord, if we, as your children, will walk in that living hope, I can only imagine how much love we'll express to others in this life. Sharing you, loving people that are hard to love, living through and enduring all of the pain and the suffering and the struggle and the disease and death, knowing that when we die, just as I've seen over and over again, Lord, I sent your spirit there with people that pass, your presence strong, leading us to the other side and to your family, because to be absent from the body is to be present with you. And so, Lord, for anybody here that has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ, I pray now that they would do that. They would give their lives to Jesus. They would trust him with his life and death and resurrection, putting total faith in those things, knowing that, Lord, it is the way to salvation, and it's the easy way to both. Salvation, eternal life. Lord, you just want us to believe in you, to trust you, to know who you are, and to love you, and to be in relationship with you. We pray for those in our lives that are not there right now. We lift them up to you and just pray, Lord, that you would draw them close to you. You'd pour out your Holy Spirit in their lives, and that the conviction of sin in their hearts and minds, God, would compel them to know they need you and need this salvation in you. And Lord, as we come to you now, I want to close praying for the wars that are going on in this world. Why do the nations rage, the psalmist says. The nations rage because we are absent of the relationship we need to be having with you. We pray, Lord, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit and the raging nations and the warring nations. Protect the innocent. Protect the oppressed. For those who are true enemies, God, and those that are terrorizing God, that you would deliver them unto yourself just as you did the Apostle Paul and change the outcomes, God, in their lives. Protect the children, the women, the men, all of them. And Father, we pray for your strong right arm to support the situations that are going on on our planet, not just in the two areas I've described. There's so much conflict everywhere. We all just need your son to reign in our lives. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for a benediction? I went a little long. I hope everyone is okay with that today. I guess you didn't have a, 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 an option, right? So I probably shouldn't say that kind of thing because if, if you're thinking, well, it was a little long. It's not like you had a choice. But there was a lot there. If anyone needs prayer, if anyone has any questions about these things, please come forward and ask, all right? Be happy to answer those questions. Pray for one another. Be there for each other. Connect with one another. One another. The, the body of Christ needs each other in these days. It is a strength, and it's a joy to be with you all. And so many of you are walking through so many different things right now that, you know, when you share a message like that, <clears throat> those things are coming to mind to me. Please know that, that, that you're... Your needs right now are on my heart and in my prayers and my morning prayers and others. We have a prayer team that Rhea 
uh, you know, sends all of the needs to us with, you know, with a lot of frequency. Ray, maybe you could raise your hand over there. And so if you just have anything, tell her there are people that are talking to God about these things. So you don't just have to pray now. We're praying all week. It's good to see you all. How about a benediction? The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord make his countenance to fall on every one of us. And may he put his name on our heads all of the days of our lives and his spirit to lead us in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Amen.